Chapter Six of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ring doves and pigeons. One morning at daybreak, Florent forgot his duties at the market and explored each street in the vicinity of the Palais Bourbon. He went as far as the Esplanade des Invalides and measured certain distances by taking long strides then he went to the quai d'orsay and leaning over the parapet decided that the attack should be simultaneous the band from gocaillou would arrive by the champ de mars the sections from the north of paris should sweep down by the madeleine those of the west and south must follow the quai he looked toward the opposite shore with some anxiety the champs elysees and the wide avenues were difficult to deal with he saw too that cannon placed there would sweep the whole quai then he changed some details of his plan and made several alterations in the paper he held in his hand the real attack should be made by la rue du bourgogne and la rue de l'universable the sun now touched his shoulders and shone on the wide sidewalks and gilded the monuments opposite him he saw the battle he saw men clinging to these columns and then far above he beheld lean hands flinging out the flag to the breeze he went slowly homeward suddenly he heard a soft cooing sound and realized that he was in the garden of the tuileries and saw the turtle doves sunning themselves on the lawn he leaned against a box that held a huge orange tree and looked around the shadow of the large chestnut trees was very heavy the air was sweet with perfume and made him think of madame francois a little girl ran past with her hoop and frightened the turtle doves they flew away and alighted on the arm of a marble athlete in the centre of the green sward where they pecked and plumed themselves as he entered the hall he heard the voice of claude lancy calling to him come with me said the painter i am looking for that little brute marjolin florent followed him merely to get away from himself and to put off as long as possible his return to his distasteful duties at the market claude said that marjolin was perfectly happy he was a mere beast walking on two legs instead of four that was about all the difference he may be stuffing the pigeons said claude we could go and see they went into the cellar in the centre of which two fountains were playing the houses here were devoted exclusively to pigeons behind the gratings there arose a plaintive sound a perpetual rippling note claude laughed and said to his companion i should think all the lovers in paris were in this place but as every one of these rooms or houses seemed to be locked he came to the conclusion that marjolin could not be in the cellar suddenly they heard the sound of a gentle continual kissing and they discovered one door that was ajar they pushed it open and beheld cadine with marjolin kneeling in front of her so that his face was on a level with her lips she was kissing him tenderly on his hair his brow his eyes slowly and methodically he complacently remained just as she placed him and allowed her to do as she pleased he had no longer a will of his own aren't you ashamed said claude in this dirty place too but answered cadine with impudent effrontery he is afraid anywhere that is light is it not so dear you are afraid sometimes are you not he passed his hands over his face as if seeking the kisses she had left there he answered with a vague smile yes that he was afraid i came to help him too the girl added i am stuffing the pigeons florent looked at the poor creatures all around the place on shelves were uncovered boxes in which pigeons were placed close against each other every few moments a light shiver ran through the moving mass cadine had a saucepan at her side full of water and grain she filled her mouth took up the pigeons one by one opened their beaks and blew this food down their throats and they struggling and choking fell back into their boxes dizzy with the food thus swallowed by force poor things said claude they are not poor things at all they are very comfortable now in two hours they will be made to swallow salted water this makes them white and tender and two hours after that they are bled if you would like to see that done you can look at marjolin for he has fifty to do now claude and florent followed marjolin he sat down on the ground by the fountain put the box of pigeons by his side and placed on his knees a tin case with wires across set in a wooden frame he seized the pigeons by the wings and with a quick blow on the head with the handle of the knife stunned them and then inserted the point in the throat 
the pigeons shivered and he arranged them in rows the heads between these iron wires over the tin box into which the blood dropped slowly he did this with the regular movement of a machine at first but by degrees seemed to become excited his eyes glittered and he moved quicker and quicker he finally burst out laughing tick-tack 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 he sang accompanying the noise made by the knife on the heads of the poor creatures with a movement of his tongue he likes that said cadine pigeons are funny when they put their heads down so far between their shoulders that we can't find their necks she laughed again as she watched marjolin's feverish haste i have tried but i can never do it as fast as he one day he bled a hundred and ten minutes claude happening to glance at florent saw him so pale that he hastily led him to the stairs where he made him sit down well well he said who would have thought that you could faint like a woman it was the smell answered florent a little ashamed these pigeons who were made to swallow grain and salt water and then bled to death had reminded him of the turtle doves of the tuileries walking in their changeable satiny plumage on the turf golden with sunlight he saw them gurgling and cooing on the arm of the antique statue in the silent garden while in the dark shadow of the chestnut trees the little girl played with her hoop this huge senseless brute killing these little creatures had chilled him to the marrow of his bones you will make no kind of a soldier my boy said claude the people who sent you to cayenne were simple creatures to be afraid of you look out my dear fellow never to get into any trouble for if you should fire a pistol and happen to kill any one you would faint away florent rose but did not answer he had become very serious and heavy lines contracted his forehead he went away leaving claude to return to the pigeons and marjolin as he walked through the fish market he thought again of his plan of attack and of the armed bands which would invade the palais bourbon in the champs elysees the cannon would reverberate the windows would be broken there would be blood and brains spattered on the columns a rapid vision passed before his eyes he passed his hand over them not daring to look as he crossed la rue du pont neuf he thought he saw a goose's pale face in the fruit market he seemed to be waiting or watching for some one and his eyes were wide open with a wild stare he suddenly turned and fled in the direction of the charcuterie what on earth is the matter thought florent he behaves as if he were afraid of me grave events had taken place that morning at the quenu gradels at daybreak auguste had rushed to the room of his employers to tell them that the police had come to arrest florent and then added in a confused way that he thought florent had got away la belle lisa in her dressing-gown ran upstairs and took the photograph of la belle normande from the drawer of her brother-in-law and went down again on the landing she met the police agent who begged to speak to her a moment he bade her open her shop as usual and to say nothing to any one he put his men into possession of florent's room thus was the trap laid and baited lisa's only anxiety in this whole affair was as to how quenu would receive this blow she feared that he would ruin all by his tears if he should discover that the police was there as yet he had not been disturbed and she prepared a little tale with which to delude him when he awoke in another half hour she was at her door with her hair as carefully dressed as usual accurately dressed and smiles on her rosy face auguste was arranging the shop quenu came out yawned a little and shook himself in the fresh morning air nothing indicated the drama that was in preparation but the commissary himself was the one to awaken suspicion in the quartier by making a domiciliary visit to the mahoudans he was furnished with the most accurate information in the anonymous letters received at the prefecture it was said that la belle normande was the mistress of florent she therefore had probably sheltered and concealed him now the commissary accompanied by two men shook the door and demanded admittance in the name of the law the mahoudans were hardly up the old woman opened the door in a rage which was suddenly calmed when she understood what the demand meant she took a seat and calmly fastened her clothing while she said you can look where you choose gentlemen we are honest people and have nothing to fear as la normande did not see fit to open her door the commissary ordered it to be forced she was dressing and her shoulders were bare this brutal entrance exasperated her 
the skirt that she was just throwing over her head dropped from her hands and she rushed forward red with anger rather than shame the commissary faced by this half-naked woman advanced in front of his men saying in a cold stern voice in the name of the law in the name of the law she fell into a chair weeping and sobbing her hair streamed over her shoulders her chemise did not reach her knees the men looked away while the commissary caught up a shawl and threw it over her but she did not notice it she wept hysterically as she saw these men open her wardrobe and look under her bed what have i done she gasped what are you looking for here the commissary uttered florent's name just as mother mahoudin entered the room a wretch cried her daughter rushing toward her one of the men caught her and wrapped her in the shawl she struggled and said for what do you take me then this florent never crossed this threshold put me in prison if you choose what do i care for this florent i can marry a better man than he any day this flood of words calmed her her fury now turned against florent who was the cause of this insult she addressed the commissary and tried to justify herself i did not know sir he was very quiet and very gentle and he deceived us all i did not want to listen to the people who abused him he came to give my little boy lessons for which i tried to pay an occasional present of a fine fish and this is all but where are the papers he gave you to take care of papers he never gave me any papers if he had i would give them to you i swear i would rather than see you rummage among all my things in this way i tell you it is not worth while for you to look the men having completed their search in her room now opened a door leading to the closet where much slept in a moment the child was heard crying aloud awakened from a deep sleep he apparently thought he was about to be murdered la normande called to him and he ran to her and clung about her neck she consoled him and placed him in her own bed the men were about to leave when the child said in a whisper don't let them take my copy-books to be sure your copy-books cried la normande wait a moment gentlemen i have something for you you will see plenty of his writing now and if you wish to hang him do so i won't cut the rope she handed them the copy-books which utterly infuriated the child who began to kick and scratch his mother who was trying to hold him finding that he could not get away he began to bellow mademoiselle saget stuck in her head she had come finding the doors all open saying that she really pitied these poor ladies who had no one to defend them in the meantime the commissary was reading the copies set by florent with a heavy frown he gave a little tap to the paper this is very serious he said very serious indeed he handled the bundle of copy-books to one of his men and departed claire who had not appeared now opened her door and looked at the men as they went downstairs she then entered her sister's room where she had not been for a year mademoiselle saget was fluttering about la belle normande caressing her and wrapping the shawl more closely about her you are a mean coward said claire planting herself before her sister who started up the shawl again falling to the floor you were listening were you say that again if you dare you are a mean coward repeated the girl in a tone that was even more insulting then la normande rushed forward and slapped claire's pale face who frail as she was grasped her sister by the throat they struggled for a moment tearing out each other's hair the younger with superhuman force pushed the other against the wardrobe the glass of which shivered much sobbed and mother mahoudin shrieked to mademoiselle saget to separate them but claire shook herself free mean coward that you are she repeated i am now going to warn the man you have sold her mother threw herself across the door and la normande with the assistance of the little old maid hustled claire into her room whose door they locked there was a dead silence and then a dull grating sound she is trying to take off the hinges with her scissors said la normande contemptuously as she went about trying to find her clothes which had been somewhat scattered in the melee she would have killed me without any hesitation said la normande if she could and now she must be kept in her room or she will make the most fearful row in the quartier mademoiselle saget was naturally in great haste to depart she reached the corner of la rue pirouette just as the commissary and his men went into the charcuterie 
she followed in such a state of excitement that lisa made a sign to her to be quiet with a glance at quenu when they went into the kitchen the old maid told what had taken place at the mahoudens lisa listened with an air of triumph but when a customer asked for two pig's feet she wrapped them up thoughtfully as she said look here to show you that i have no enmity against la normande you may tell her that i have saved this from the police and am ready to give it back to her if she comes and asks me for it she took the photograph from her pocket mademoiselle saget looked at it and read aloud louise to her good friend florent then in a significant tone she said you make a mistake you should keep this no answered lisa i wish this affair to be ended once for all to-day is the day for a reconciliation and after this i hope the quartier will settle down do you want me to tell la belle normande that you would like to see her yes if you would be so kind mademoiselle saget returned to la rue pirouette and frightened the fishwoman out of her senses by telling her that her picture was in lisa's pocket but she could not at once decide to make the concession demanded by her rival she too had her conditions to make she would go if the charcutière would come to the door to receive her the old maid was obliged to make two more trips between the rivals in order to make the arrangement satisfactory to both parties mademoiselle saget was quite willing to take this trouble as she was to be credited with the reconciliation which would of course cause such excitement in the quartier as she passed claire's door she still heard the noise of the scissors as soon as these points were settled she went off in a hurry to get madame lecoeur and la sarriette they established themselves nearly opposite of the charcuterie where they could see the entire interview the three women became very impatient as they waited there the story had got abroad in the hall and every one was on the qui vive while eyes were turned toward the shop of the quenu gradel and when la normande appeared they held their breath look at her earrings said la sarriette just see how she walks exclaimed madame lecoeur it is for all the world like a peacock la belle normande in fact held herself like a queen who condescends to sign a treaty of peace she had made a most careful toilette and had turned up a corner of her crisp white apron to show her black cashmere skirt at her throat was a gorgeous tie of lace as she felt that the whole hall were looking at her she carried her head still higher she stopped at the door of the charcuterie now it is the turn of la belle lisa said mademoiselle saget lisa left her counter with smiling grace she crossed her shop with a leisurely step and extended her hand to la belle normande she was carefully dressed her collar apron and cuffs of immaculate purity the two women disappeared within the shop and the spectators could exchange remarks as it was no use to try and hear she is buying something said mademoiselle saget la belle normande is certainly buying something and look lisa is giving her the photograph then followed more salutations and la belle lisa accompanied her fair rival to the very sidewalk there they stood and talked for a good five minutes for the edification of the quartier who felt that the quarrel was happily concluded but mademoiselle saget would not allow her two companions to leave her the crowning act of the drama was near at hand and now la belle normande has no lover said madame lecoeur she has monsieur le bigre remarked la sarriette laughing oh monsieur le bigre he won't have her now mademoiselle saget shrugged her shoulders murmuring you know nothing about it he won't trouble himself much about this affair la normande is rich and in two months they will be man and wife you will see mother mahoudin has done her best to bring this marriage about for a long time but said madame lecoeur after all there has nothing wrong been found out laurent was not in her room not then answered the old maid significantly but that does not prove that he has not been there i believe myself that he has just gone the worst of the whole thing was she continued the horrible things these men said before little much now i don't mean that the child amounts to much but that is no reason why the police should be allowed to frighten him out of his senses but look there is poor monsieur quenu and he is laughing quenu in fact was standing on the sidewalk in his white apron talking with madame taboureau's little servant 
he was in the best of spirits that morning and lisa had the greatest difficulty in the world in keeping him in the kitchen she walked up and down the shop impatiently fearing that florent would come in and that her husband would be there she is in a fever said mademoiselle saget her poor husband knows nothing about it at all just see him laugh now you know that madame taboureau said she should quarrel with the quenus if they were so weak-minded as to keep florent with them any longer and in the meantime they have all the money said madame lecoeur by no means my dear he has had his share is that really so do you know it i know it answered the old maid but she did not say how he has even had more than he is entitled to ah a profligate man makes the money fly and then you know there is another woman i did not know it answered la sarriette but i am not surprised yes the wife of the former inspector madame valoque the others exclaimed at this madame valoque was so ugly but i know it continued mademoiselle saget there are proofs piles of letters from that woman letters asking him for money and i believe that they too killed the husband la sarriette and madame lecoeur were convinced of course but they were tired of waiting they said to each other that their stalls were left alone and were probably robbed by this time but mademoiselle saget begged them to stay a moment longer all the time keeping her own eyes riveted on the house whose front was bathed in the morning sun who would think that it was full of police murmured madame lecoeur they are in the attic look i can see one now behind those plants on the terrace the others extended their necks but could see nothing no i was mistaken it was a shadow explained la sarriette they must be sitting still in the room at this moment they saw gavard come out of the fish market with a preoccupied air he was coming toward them have you seen florent he asked as he reached them they did not reply i want to see him at once continued gavard he is not in the fish market has he gone in the three women were all unnaturally pale and their lips trembled madame lecoeur was the first to speak we have been here only a few moments she said he may have gone in then i will undertake those five flights of stairs answered gavard laughing la sarriette opened her lips as if to warn him but her aunt held her arm tightly let him go she whispered and he may perhaps learn not to walk over us another time la sarriette stood still with a flushed face but the others were yellow white they looked at the house as if they could see gavard through the stones as he ascended the stairs la sarriette uttered a nervous little laugh when she thought her uncle had had time to reach florent's room they fancied that they saw the curtains move fifteen minutes elapsed and all was quiet then a man came out of the alley and went for a fiacre in another five minutes gavard came down with two men gavard was very pale he had been searched and his pistol and box of cartridges taken from him he thought himself lost and was surprised that the idea of this denouement had never entered his head the tuileries would never forgive him his limbs felt strangely weak but he held himself straight determined that the Halles should see that he died bravely madame lecoeur and la sarriette rushed to his side and begged for an explanation he took his niece in his arms and as he kissed her murmured in her ear as he gave her a key burn all my papers he entered the fiacre with the air of a man ascending the scaffold when the carriage disappeared around the corner madame lecoeur saw her niece trying to hide the key you need not take so much trouble she said between her teeth i saw him put it in your hand as true as there is a god in heaven i will go before the prefect and declare the truth unless you share with me but my dear aunt answered la sarriette with an embarrassed smile let us go at once before those thieves get there mademoiselle saget who had heard all this followed their fleet steps as quickly as she could as they neared gavard's home she offered to go on and explain to madame leonce the reason of their coming we will see to it ourselves said madame lecoeur stiffly the housekeeper was by no means willing to show these ladies upstairs she looked austerely at la sarriette's untidy fichu but when mademoiselle saget said a few words in a low voice and showed her the key she yielded take everything 
she said, throwing herself into a chair as if abandoning all hope. La Sarriette tried the key in all the wardrobes, while Madame Necoeur watched her closely, and stood so near to her that finally she exclaimed, Please stand a little farther off, aunt. I can't use my arms. At last a wardrobe opposite the window was opened. The four women uttered a simultaneous exclamation. On the center shelf were ten thousand francs in methodical little piles gavard whose property was prudently deposited in the hands of a notary kept this sum in reserve ready for an emergency he looked on them as aid to the insurrection and dreamed at night that a battle was going on within his wardrobe he heard the beat of drums the rattling of musketry and triumphant shouts it was his money which did all this la sarriette uttered a little shriek of joy and extended her hands paws off my dear exclaimed madame lecoeur in a hoarse voice the woman was slowly dying of an affection of the liver but her skin turned yellower than ever and seemed to reflect the gold which lay before her peering over her shoulder was mademoiselle saget standing on the points of her toes in an ecstasy of delight my uncle told me to take everything said la sarriette and am i who have watched over him in sickness and in health to have nothing asked the housekeeper Madame Lecoeur pushed them all away, and, planting herself before the wardrobe, she said, I am his nearest relative, and you are robbers, all of you, she added with some violence. There was a long and profound silence. The four women looked at each other. La Sarriette, palpitating with life, youth, and hope, offered a strange contrast to the other women. But, continued Madame Lecoeur, we do not wish to quarrel about it. You are his niece his only niece and we will divide we will each of us take a pile in turn she bade the other two step back and she began she took one pile which disappeared among her skirts then la sarriette did the same then the two hands laid side by side on the shelf one with horrible distorted fingers the other white delicate and supple as silk there was one pile left which the aunt claimed but la sarriette disputed this as it was her aunt who commenced the division and she divided it between madame leonce who had seen them pocket the gold with gasps of horror and mademoiselle saget bless my soul said the housekeeper fifty francs for taking care of that old man all this time he said he had no family the old cheat madame lecoeur before closing the wardrobe wished to search it thoroughly it contained all the political books which were not allowed to cross the frontiers pamphlets from brussels scandalous tales of the bonapartes and caricatures of the emperor one of gavard's greatest delights had been to shut himself up and show a friend these compromising papers he begged us to burn these papers said la sarriette nonsense there is no fire and we had best be off hardly had they reached the foot of the stairs than the police appeared Madame Léonce went back to show them to Gavard's rooms. The others pursued their way, the aunt and niece somewhat incommoded by the weight of their full pockets, but enjoying them all the same. Mademoiselle Saget held her fifty francs tight in her hand, all the time revolving a plan for obtaining something more from out of those full pockets. "'There is Florent!' she exclaimed as they neared the fish market. Florent it was indeed he was going to his office to change his coat having completed his daily task it seemed to him that people looked at him strangely he wondered if there were any trouble in store for him but as he passed the mahoudan stall he was surprised to hear the old woman say in a gentle voice monsieur florent there was a gentleman looking for you i think he has gone to your room to wait for you there the old fishwoman sitting in her stall enjoyed as she uttered these words a refinement of vengeance which shook her enormous frame with joy florent looked questioningly at la belle normande who now on the best of terms with her mother was bustling about and pretended not to hear you are sure he asked oh certainly one couldn't be sure she answered in a sharp voice florent thought that this gentleman had come in relation to the great affair he was about leaving the market when as he turned he caught sight of la belle normande who was watching him with a very grave face he passed the three women you notice murmured mademoiselle saget that there is no one in the shop la belle lisa is not the woman to compromise herself 
it was true the charcuterie was empty the house lay basking in the sunlight with a comfortable sort of air the flowers were blooming gaily high up on the balcony and as florent crossed the sidewalk he nodded to logre and to m de bigre who were standing at the door of the wine-shop these gentlemen smiled in a friendly sort of way he was about to enter the narrow alley when he perceived auguste's pale face flash through the darkness he turned back and looked into the shop but saw only monton who glared at him out of his large yellow eyes his whiskers had a fiercer aspect than usual when he finally entered the alley he saw la belle lisa watching him from behind a curtain of a glass door profound silence reigned in the fish market every eye was fixed on that house suddenly a laugh ran around the hall mother mehuden's story of the gentleman waiting to see florent struck them as a capital joke at last the skeleton mother mehuden's favorite name for the inspector was caught and they wished him bon voyage hoping devoutly that his successor was better looking la belle normande looked on at this joy and had great difficulty in restraining her tears meanwhile florent had gone up to his room where he allowed himself to be taken without the smallest resistance which he saw would be utterly useless he took a chair and looked at the men as they turned over the papers and opened all the packages of scarves and badges this denouement was after all no surprise to him and was in fact rather a relief although he would not have confessed even to himself that such was the case his keenest sufferings were caused by the remembrance of the hatred which had pushed him into this room he recalled auguste's pale face and the whispers of the fishwomen he remembered mother mehuden's words the silence of la normande and the vacant shop and said to himself that all these people were accomplices and that the quartier had delivered him up among this crowd of faces which he saw as he sat with his hands pressed over his eyes suddenly appeared quenu's pale face he was cut to the heart come on said the police agent roughly he rose and went down with the men on the next floor he asked to be allowed to go back for something he had forgotten but the man pushed him on he offered them money even and finally two agreed to go back with him swearing they would break his head if he played them any trick they took their revolvers from their pockets he returned to his room went to the cage and took out the bird kissed it on its glossy head and let it fly he watched as it lighted on the roof of the fish market and then was off again disappearing over the hall he looked out toward the sky and thought of the doves in the garden of the tuileries and then of the pigeons quivering in marjolaine's hands he bowed his head and followed the men who shrugged their shoulders and put their revolvers in their pockets at the foot of the stairs florent stopped before the door which opened on the kitchen of the charcuterie the commissary who was waiting there was touched by his submissiveness and said do you wish to bid your brother good-bye he hesitated a moment he looked at the door from behind which came a deafening noise of choppers and mallets lisa to occupy her husband had suggested making the pudding which was usually done in the evening onions were frying on the fire florent heard quenu say zounds this pudding will be good florent thanked the commissary but was afraid to go into that hot kitchen full of the smell of cooking he passed the door strong in the belief that his brother knew nothing and hastening his steps to avoid giving him an additional sorrow as he entered the fiacre he felt ashamed to know that all the fishwomen were triumphing over him how guilty he looks whispered madame le coeur yes added mademoiselle saget he has the air of a convict i once saw a man guillotined murmured la sarriette who had just that expression they stretched out their necks to look into the fiacre just as it drove off the old maid pulled the skirts of her companions to call their attention to claire who was running toward them with flying hair and bleeding hands she had torn open her door when she understood that she was too late she shook her fist at the fiacre with impotent rage then rushed away as swiftly as she had come the plaster rising in fine clouds from her garments as she moved he must have promised to marry her cried la sarriette laughing the quartier now calmed down though groups still passed the windows of the charcuterie looking in curiously lisa did not appear at the counter 
she left augustine to attend to all the duties there she intended to tell all to canu that afternoon lest some shatterbox should disclose the truth too abruptly she wanted to be alone with him in the kitchen knowing that he would burst into tears and make a terrible scene she therefore proceeded with much care but as soon as he understood it he dropped upon the chopping-block and sobbed like a child poor dear boy said lisa smoothing his arm you must not go on like this you will hurt yourself his sobs subsided and when he could speak he said you can never know how good he was to me when we were living in la rue royer collard he did everything there he swept and cooked he loved me as if i were his own child he worked like a dog and came home tired to death and i had all i wanted to eat and was warm and lazy and now they will shoot him lisa exclaimed at this and told him that florent would not be shot that was ridiculous he shook his head and continued no i never loved him half enough i was selfish and mean and i wanted to keep his money but i offered it to him twenty times she interrupted we have nothing to reproach ourselves with i know that you have always been goodness itself to him but i have been selfish and i believe if i had shared everything with him that he would not have turned out badly a second time it is all my own fault she was very gentle with him she even expressed sympathy for florent he was guilty certainly and if he had had more money he might not have committed so many follies and by degrees she hazarded the opinion that perhaps it was better as it was quenu wiped his eyes and ceased sobbing that he might hear what she said and at last put his hand mechanically on his chopping knife you have not been well said lisa nor have i and i was really very anxious about you and the shop too has been a very different place yes indeed sobbed quenu and you must remember added lisa that you have a wife and a child to think of you have duties to fulfil toward us he smiled faintly lisa had done wonders she called pauline who was playing in the shop placed her on her father's knees and said pauline ask your father to be good and not make us miserable the child did as she was told the two looked at each other and then at their child and they smiled with a sense of relief that they were once more by themselves while the charcutière repeated two or three times there are only three of us dear only three of us two months later florent was condemned again to exile the affair made a great noise the journals got hold of all the details gave portraits of the accused and drawings of the scarves and rosettes and the names of the places where the bands were to meet all paris discoursed for a week on the conspiracy of the halle the police looked the personification of mystery and importance it was generally believed that the whole of the quartier was undermined at the corps législatif the excitement was so great that the centre and the right forgot the untoward law of endowment which had momentarily divided them and became reconciled voting by an overpowering majority for the imposition of an unpopular tax of which the faubourgs dared not complain so great was the panic in the city florent was considerably amazed at the exaggerated number of accomplices which were given to him and the trial lasted a week logre was acquitted as was lacaille alexandre was given two years in prison and gavard like florent was condemned to transportation this was a terrible blow to the old man who was thus made to pay dearly for what he regarded more as a frolic than anything else and the tears streamed down the frightened face of this white-haired gamin one morning in august just as the markets were beginning to be astir claude lantier went to madame francois who sat with a sad face among her vegetables the painter was very quiet notwithstanding the golden sun that lay on the green velvet of the cabbages by her side well he said it is all over they are sending him away he is far on his way to brest by this time the market woman made a gesture of profound despair she waved her hands and said it is paris this horrible paris no madame answered claude it is all these wretched people you have no idea of the falsehoods they told in court nor of the follies they committed will you believe that they even brought forward the child's writing-books claude clenched his fists 
he was seized with a nervous shiver and pulled his coat up never was there a more gentle soul he said i once saw him turn pale at seeing a pigeon killed i absolutely laughed with pity when i saw him between the two gendarmes i loved him because he was good and honourable we shall never see him again he ought to have listened to me said the market woman he should have come to nanterre and lived there with me and my rabbits he liked me and i loved him because i knew that i could trust him ah me come and see me some morning monsieur claude i will make an omelette for you it is a pity and he might have been so happy tears filled her eyes she rose to her feet with the air of a woman who is determined to shake off all her troubles here comes mother chantemesse after her turnips she said claude sauntered off the markets were beginning to look very gay he saw la sarriette with a gold watch stuck in her belt busy with her prunes and strawberries stopping from time to time to pull the whiskers of her friend jules who wore a new short velvet coat he saw madame lecoeur and mademoiselle saget less yellow than they used to be laughing immoderately at some story the old maid was telling in the fish market mother mahoudin who had resumed her stall reigned triumphant over the new inspector a very young man while claire languidly placed in her tank a quantity of shining whitings at the tripe stall auguste and augustine were whispering over the pig's feet they were buying with that unmistakable air of a newly married people as he walked past the charcuterie much and pauline were playing horse in front of the shop door much was on all fours while pauline seated on his back clutched at his hair to preserve her balance on the roof of the halle he saw two shadows they were those of cadine and marjolin kissing each other claude said to himself with a sardonic smile that it was the old story the fat people had as usual triumphed here they all were hearty and well and florent pushed to the wall as he stood facing la rue pirouette the spectacle on his right and his left put the finishing touch to his exasperation on the right side of the street la belle normande or as she was now called la belle madame le bigre stood at the door of her shop her husband had obtained permission to add to his wine shop a counter for the sale of tobacco this had been a favourite dream of his now gratified for sundry mysterious services rendered madame le bigre was really superb in her silk dress and crimped hair arrayed in all this glory to take her seat at the counter where the gentlemen of the quartier came to buy their cigars and packages of tobacco she looked quite the lady and everything was new and shining about her opposite la belle lisa occupied the entire width of her door never had her linen been so immaculate never had her face worn a more peaceful aspect framed as it was by her shining hair she seemed to be too tranquilly happy even to smile she was the personification of absolute contentment her dimpled hands were half hidden in her apron they were not even extended to receive the happiness of the day so sure was she that it would come to her the shop too had resumed its former air of gaiety the tongues and the sausages no longer had that disconsolate air which so disturbed Quenu from the kitchen came a gay resounding laugh accompanied by a rattling of saucepans and all about the shop indicated that the unfortunate episode of florent's sojourn was totally forgotten the two women leaned forward and exchanged a cordial greeting and claude who perhaps had not dined the previous evening was filled with rage at seeing them so prosperous and comfortable he drew his belt tighter and said angrily what scoundrels honest men can be End of chapter 6 End of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola Recorded by Céline Major